Hey guys, Ravy here. I'm back, I guess. Um, basically, I just wanted to go play Fallout 4 and like video games, just chill and do my other things. And I'm like, uh, like yeah, actually, I can do that because this is a hobby. And I'm like, all right, I'll just go do that. Um, and I was, uh, I kind of started reading on um, well, Heat 7, and then I got a little bit bored with the story. And I was like, whatever, I'll just go do that. So. Uh, yeah, there was a couple of weeks there where all I played was a Fallout 4 and podcasts and watch some movies and whatever. I just enjoyed myself with other things that wasn't reading. <laughs> I just wanted to take a break, pretty much. Um, so yeah, I'm back with Heat 7, which came out in 2010. I quite like this cover. It's one of my more favourite ones because it's very, I guess, stylized and and uh, striking and very kind of cool to look at. Um, because I know for the longest time I wanted to read it because I wanted to know this story that the cover was about. You know, wolves, otters, oh my god, super cool. Um, and yeah, and then the back cover's pretty cool. It's like uh, more of an extended illustration and nice colourful piece of uh, the, f the first story. Um, oh, what was it? Oh, by a nose. I don't know why I don't remember that. Um, so I guess going into it... Um, the first story is uh, By a Nose by Tony Gray Fox and Art by Yuki. Both of them are very familiar names, but I can't place them. Um, so I, I quite like By a Nose. Like, it's, uh, well, obviously, it's a story heavily focused on uh, the main character, German Shepherd, who's uh, on a business convention uh, to Vegas, and he's hooking up with his, his longtime flame that he kind of wants to elope with. And uh, he gets involved in shady business, um, and he uses his nose. Well, he's he's nabbed for the use of his nose. And um, I guess before I go into it, like coming off, um, shit, was it sli slippery times? Slip, slip. I think it was slippery times by um, uh, Foosball in the previous issue of Heat. I don't know if it was directly the last one, or maybe the one before that, uh, where it had. Uh, the fire scene character. I'm pretty sure her name wasn't Jane. I, I, I can't quite remember it. But there's a really heavy piece where she was using her nose to smell fins and whatever. And, it, you know, kind of coming off that, like, uh, just seeing how the author in top, in, interpreted uh, explaining that kind of sense in text, it wasn't as good, <laughs> to put it bluntly. Like, it was, it was alright, but it was like, just coming off as well, it's like, oh man. <laughs> just like bad luck, really. Um, but yeah, other than that, it's quite cool. Um, it, I've also been kind of reading Fan 7 off on the side, which is an anthology set all in Vegas, so I kind of got mixed up in there. Because, um, yeah, this is set in Vegas. Um, I'm rambling now. Um, so, fuck, who was... So, yeah, follows Rolf, and he, he's on this holiday, and he hooks up um, with his cat girlfriend or whatever, and she's... Uh, he, he keeps, like, asking her, like, come on, come away, you know, we'll get hitched and whatever, and she's like, oh, no, I need to look after Ma and my brothers, and, like, ever since my father died. It's really, like, cagey and shady. And then she gets kidnapped, and he has he's uh, forced to help this uh, gangster Tomcat um, and his goon cat goons and um, find uh, some dude he's missing because he's got the nose and he can smell him out. Um, and he escapes them uh, and runs to Cat Girl. And uh, I guess I'll go into spoilers with this one because I kind of want to talk more about the ending. Um, and, and yeah, he runs to his girlfriend and there's pretty kind of, I guess more of a comedy sex scene with the way it ends, um, and she kind of betrays him, because it turns out the, the gangster Tom Katz, her older brother, and she's just like, no, no, like, you need to do this for him, and then, like, it'll be square, it'll be square, and, you know, he's understandably pissed about this betrayal, or whatever, because, like, she literally, like, ties into the bed, and, like, she's, you know, they're about to get it on, and, uh... Yeah, uh, the fucking brother comes in and he's got his massive, massive fucking red hot dog cock poking, showing. Um, and, and yeah, and then they continue on with the search. 
and um, the big reveal is like the, what what all well, the cats are fighting over is like this big shipment of catnip, and it's a it's a pretty. I think what I do like about the story is just the the final scene where uh, he just turns the table on all of them and then um, you know walks out on that chick, understandably. <laughs> um, but I don't know. It, it's a weird one because I've also read this story before, like years and years ago, so it wasn't new and fresh, and then going through it again, it was just like, I mean, it's memorable, like, I still remembered it after however long, but it's just like, nothing's really popped out, um, but it is cool, I can, I quite like the art on this one, uh, it's nice, kind of, oh, close to a double spread, kind of going on there, with the title image, um, um, so I guess pff, moving on uh, is uh, a werewolf's last war- well, bleh, bleh, bleh. <coughs> a werewolf's last warning, which is a poem by Wu Wei, uh, illustrated by Solop Asp again. Um, with, uh, which is it's got a lovely illustration that's very lewd. Um, and yeah, no, I, I quite like this one. It's, it's a poem that tickled my fancy. Um, <laughs> yeah, um, I'm not too sure what else to say, as usual with poems. Um, next up, we got The Day I Met You uh, by Corgi, which is uh, it's an adorable comic. Um, you know, it's a, it's a very kind of typical story. Uh, he bumps into this dude, and then they... Uh, he spills something on him. Or, no, he gets something spilt on him, and then the stranger takes him back to his place and offers him some, a shower and clean clothes, and they have dinner, and, like, they kind of go, hit it off really well, and, and it turns out he's gay, and I'm gay, and uh, they get on. It's just like... <laughs> I mean, if it was someone else, it wasn't me, they'd be like, really? It's him. I, I couldn't care less. <laughs> I'm so fucking tired of that story. <laughs> I'm just like, yup. Um... And I do really like Corgi's, like, expressions and, uh, the way he draws his characters. But one thing that really fucking irked me is that, um, there was this very kind of steady, weird texture going on. I really don't know if it will convey well on the webcam, but, shit, let's move that. But, is it this page or this page? Where... If you, I don't know if you can see it too well, but... Oh, God, I'm probably super loud. Uh, so, their shirts and pretty much any other kind of coloured surface has this very consistent texture going on. Um, and it's so distracting. <laughs> like, like, especially there's a later scene where um, he's got his uh, hand on uh, Corgi's leg and... It, their shirt, their pants, the other guy's shirt, they have the same pervasive texture. <laughs> I'm just like, <laughs> I just, re- I just really don't like it. Uh, I'm sure, you know, someone could explain, like, well, I was like this, but it's, it's just very odd. Um, oh, okay, so one thing I will say is that, um, I really do like, uh, uh the Corgi character, uh, is... Uh, pretty pudgy, and I, I quite like that kind of body type um, being explored in comics because uh, you don't see it all the time. And he, mind you, he is pretty sexy. Oh yeah, and shit, I forgot they use um, safe sex. Um, the the German Shepherd wears a condom as he fucks the corgi, which is I guess rare. <laughs> um, it's kind of not too mentioned. Um, Oh, they come at the same time. Shit, that's right. Oh, that's another <laughs> negative one for me. <laughs> um, shit. Okay, I guess. Um, yeah, that's that's uh, that's it. It's just not not for me. I just really did not enjoy the comic. Um, again, I, I'd read it before, and I'm just like, oh. <laughs> um. So next up, we've got uh, one night by uh, Farrar Meridian. Uh, illustrated by Dark Natasha. And, oh my god, Dark Natasha again brings her fucking A game with this wonderful illustration here with the the wolf and the moon and the the dark trees and the leaves and and um, and uh, I guess I'm gonna be blunt with this story as well. I I really didn't like it <laughs> like at all. 
<laughs> I, was, I was really losing my patience. Um, I guess to be blunt, it's a very it's a very simple fantasy love story between two lovers from different, I guess you could say, tribes or cities. Um, the wolves are a nomad tribe called the um, fuck. What was it? Uh, sorry, the, uh, called the Kalir, uh, and, and okay. So there's hints of magic early on, and there's talk of the darkness being a, a figurative darkness with monsters and evil claws or something like I mean it sounded cool going into it but it didn't pan out um and so yeah there's, so there's the nomad wolves there's the uh, and, they, and their power is that they're air, not fuck I, I, I the fucking I'm gonna be listening they're airbenders they control the air and the clouds and whatever and then there's um how do I pronounce them? The Renfani Otter, uh, Sivrin, uh, who is from the city of the Renfani Otters, who are uh, water hydromancers, waterbenders, whatever you want to call them. And um, one night when Severin and his uh, dad are walking along the bank of the river, they find... Oh, they see the the city of the fucking hydro otters um, is being trashed by demons, and, and everyone dies, and then they find this injured lone otter, and they save him, and they take him to the the underground earthbending otters, like the underground civilization, and they because they're good healers, and and then they pretty back to life, and then and that's that's that's, that's, that's the start, and then there's really not much, I guess depth going on there other than all those kind of uh, I wouldn't say tropes but classic ideas and that's what really bugs me and so yeah he heal they heal him but you know they can't stay there because they're no matter wolves so they leave him in his care and he oh yeah shit so servant's like 14 at this time and the otter that they rescued is miraculously 14 as well oh my god same age probably got the same fucking birthday <laughs> <laughs> and um and oh hang on let me catch my train of thought and take a fucking drink and and yeah shit he hits it off with this otter when he gains consciousness and they talk and his dad's like we need to go he's like oh shit I'll come visit you in a year's time for one more night and then he does that and they he, you know they, he continues to have this relationship at, over I assume was it 14 another four years when they turn 18 for reasons <laughs> this is all assumed but I wouldn't, I wouldn't be stretch it too far and, and so yeah they fucking you know he falls in love with him despite only seeing him like one night every fucking year um like apparently everyone else is fucking shit boring in this world apparently and uh <laughs> yeah so he falls in love and then, uh, uh, it, it's hint. I, I, it's hinted at earlier that they start confessing their love, like, or they start confessing to each other that they, they don't have feelings for anyone else. And then, the one night, that is, I guess, the present day in the story. That's not fucking flashbacks. <laughs> um, he catches up, and then Severin decides to profess his love, um, to. Fucking, what the fuck's his name? Oh no, Kalir decides, no. Sorry, Severin, the wolf, decides to profess his love to the otter, Leon, and um, he does, there's a strip, there's this thing in the text where it's like, um, As I love you, Leon, he replied softly as he gazed up into the sky, as words he'd practiced for almost a year came to his muzzle, and in love, my otter, all things are possible. One needs only to see his path clearly to know what must be done, and with you, love has illuminated my path this night. 
And that's, uh, as Lin looked up, the wind ab about them began to die, to fade slowly to nothing under Kilir's will. Far above, the clouds began to swirl about, battered and pulled by the winds as they dispersed, driven back, away, and far and wide. The moon began to shine on the two young bodies as they lay in the grass, and a night full of stars watched down over them, while the Renfani were gifted hydromancers, the Kalir were masters of the air. Um, uh, as he lowered his paws again, Siverin looked back into Leon's eyes as he held the other tightly, and on this night he whispered, the sound so loud and silence after the wind died down. If you want to, I mean, Leon, I'd wish to take this chance with you just now. This is one night I wish to share myself with you and with I. The wolf stammered and blushed brightly as he lost the words he wished to express. And that really fucking bugs me, because it started saying, like, oh, he'd been practicing this for a year. Like, and then, oh, he's so embarrassed, he fucks up. And I was like, then why the fuck did you practice, mate? <laughs> like, for a year. Like, and this is, I, I think this is more just about um, Rafa and what I don't like about fantasy stories. <laughs> but, you know, when, when, when they use, like, you know, well, this one kind of falls for it. Uh, there's a few lines where the, the writer uses obtuse ways to describe the passage of time, you know, like 26 moons ago, or, or like t like four and a half barrow seasons ago, and it's like, just, just say fucking years, like you've said years previously in the text, just use years again, or months, <laughs> like, you know, they... I mean, you can, I guess you can assume the reader can assume, well, like, well, maybe they're not following a traditional 12-month calendar. Maybe there's a different set of months and the years, a different passage of time. Or it means differently. But, like, I guess explain that rather than just say moons and seasons and whatever. Because <laughs> I, lo I lose it so bad there. Um, and... and Fucking yeah, like, and I guess the main thing bugged me, besides just me not liking fantasy, is that they're even stripping away what I don't like. There's not much depth to these characters or the story. Like, it, it really is summed up as uh, a love story between uh, an otter and a wolf of two different tribes in a fantasy village. And magic plays very little to it, um, other than, I guess background world building uh, it's like you know, if if you want to bring up that he controls the air and that otter controls the water and then use it you know don't just mention it incorporate it you know fucking shit make make the darkness attack them or whatever but like i don't want to sit through fucking 10 pages of Two really boring characters telling each other that they love each other in as many words, vaguely, half the time. And it's like, oh, oh, I'm like, oh, like, fuck me. <laughs> like, I'm so beyond this shit. Um, I mean, like, you can do it, but put depth in there. Like, the, uh, I'm not going to say what I would do, but... It's just really bugged me that, you know, you strip away these fins, there's, there's not much going on there. Uh, I mean, even if I apply, I don't, I can't remember the name of it, but it's like, you know, you build a character and you're like, okay, what's one bad, what's one good thing, what's one bad thing, and what's one odd or quirky trait, and like, well, what's good about uh, the wolf, Kalir, no, sorry, Siverin. Um, he's loyal. Uh, he's devoted, okay, uh, and what's bad? Well, he's, he, he never, he never fails to get there, like, even though he, sometimes he runs late, he never fails. I guess you could say he's not good at expressing his true feelings, but then you can say the same shit as, um, fucking Leon. Uh, like, really, I can't, I can't pick of anything bad about him. Whereas, I guess you could say, oh, I guess going back to the first story with Rolf, uh, the good, uh, I guess you can say he's very trusting, he's, he's lucky, he's headstrong, he's, I guess you'd say he's headstrong 
to some degree. The bad, uh, he's a bit, I guess you could say he's a bit clueless, a bit trusting, like to a bad degree with the chick. Um, so I guess you could say one bad thing between him and Severin is that they're both pining over people that they don't see very often. <laughs> it's like, you know, I just, I can't, I was going to be like, never excuse. It's just like, a year is a very long time. <laughs> to me, at least. It's like, jeez. Um, yeah, I think that's, yeah, he's just, like, he's very, he's badly trusting. I wouldn't, I'd say that about Rolf. Uh, something quirky about Rolf. He's really good with his, the nose thing. That's quirky. Um, he was lucky at gambling, which I think kind of falls under the whole Vegas trope. The main character's going to be good at gambling. Um, and I think, I guess the other quirky tro tro um, trope that Rolf has is that he's very street smart. Like, he knew that the drug was not marijuana or whatever, that it was catnip. And, you know, he kind of saw through the game. And he, he f I could, you could say he felt very much like a noir detective without being a, a noir detective. Um, I love that about him. Um, a quirky trait about the wolf. Um, Seven. He's a shit fucking airman. It's airbender. That's for fucking sure. If you smooth the clouds out of the way so the moon can see them. <laughs> like, what's the point of that? <laughs> I mean, that's actually, shit, actually, that really fucking bugs me now. So, if they're gifted airbenders or whatever, why the fuck are they a nomadic tribe? Wouldn't they just change the climate around them so that they have perfect crops? Um, you know, I mean, coming off the back of my knowledge, like, the reason why the aboriginals in Australia were nomadic is because it was very hard to find consistent food consistently throughout the year. Like, with the wet and dry season, a lot of times, a lot of plants are only available to eat at, for, like, a very short window, so they have to keep moving, um, you know, because it's a thing, to, especially living in the desert and, like, the rainforests, and, yeah, um, oh, fuck, but I, I guess I'll just wrap it up, um, and, and, yeah, so one night ended predictably hokey, they confess love, they have perfect sex, and they come at the same time. Um, I, I really, I, I feel really bad, but I skimmed, like, the sex scene towards the end. It was, like, two pages, and I'm just like, nah, I'm so fucking done. I'm just like, yeah, whatever. <laughs> Not for me. Um, and then I read the, the rest to do with the story. And, uh, and yeah, he leaves his nomadic tribe to stay with... Um, Leon with the other otters on the ground, and he, he says something really fucking stupid. He says like, "Oh, uh, my magic is as strong as my sword arm," and I'm like, "I didn't know you fucking had a sword." Considering that it opened with you saying that you ran through the forest just in your loincloth, so why the fuck are you talking about swords all of a sudden? <laughs> and two, your magic really that fucking strong. Why don't you put on a better magic so as you confess your love to your fucking husband or boyfriend or whatever? <laughs> And then, uh, you know, and then Leon, not, fucking not Leon, Leon's dad's dead anyway. Um, Servan's dad's like, oh, you know, I don't, I can't understand, but uh, I love you and I trust you, you're making a good judge. But I'm thinking, well, if you, you must understand to some degree because you're allowing him to do this. You're happy for him. And then there's some stupid line about their god out, mentioned out of nowhere. I'm like, okay. Uh, what was it? Yeah, may Verigai get bless you with a swift journey, son, and know that I love you. And I'm like, all right, who the fuck's Verigai? <laughs> I know you don't need to explain everything for like fantasy stories, but if you're gonna have that as your closing line, maybe ex maybe explain why it's a very important blessing for his dad to say to him before he goes on this journey. Ah. I don't know. <laughs> um, yeah, that was one night. Um, but shit. Um, going on. Uh, oh, we got our first ad, uh, Cowboy Briefs. Uh, which, I'll tell you who it's by uh, at the end. It's pretty cool. Um, uh, ad. The, the little Twinkie Bull Guy. Or Cow Guy. 
Um, oh, yeah, next up is uh, Adam Wan's comic, uh, The One That Got Away, which is, uh, I mean, I'm pretty sure everyone's probably seen it these days. It's the one with the otter, uh, the, the tribal otter, and he she gets captured by the big wolf in the forest, and then he fucks her like a dirty cock sleeve, and, um... I mean, that probably wouldn't be my choice of words. <laughs> that might be his. And, and yeah, I, I'm just... Personally, I just... I'm so done with that artist. I just don't... I don't really like his stuff these days. And, um... Just reading it through, I just... I just really didn't like the language. And I... I, I guess you can say the, the status that each of the characters had. You know... The big wolf's very dominant. He can have his way with this woman. I mean, and then the woman's very pliant. Um, she's not. I mean, you can say, "Oh, we know." Well, it's still consensual, but it's like she kind of she's in this kind of defeatist kind of situation anyway. Um, and sure, you could say she takes charge, but it's like, is she just? Is it just because it's, you know, it's sex, and, you know, chicks always love sex, and, you know, it makes me wonder. Uh, and, yeah, the, the husband's a cuck, but a loser, so it's okay to steal his wife because he's a shithead. Um, yeah. Um, oh, okay, <laughs> so moving on, um, this is definitely where Heat 7 picks up a lot for me, uh, is... Just these final two stories. Um, oh, sorry, final two stories and one last comic. Um, so, second last story is A Taste of the Wild by Candrel, which I'm pretty sure is Candrel's first story in Heat, and he did a fucking amazing job. And I, so, I guess quick synopsis, because I actually really like this one, so I don't want to spoil it. Um, this business this fox. I'm kind of a bit uptight, um, rents an, an, a, not a taste of the wild, which is kind of, I guess, the business slogan of this, this werewolf prostitute, uh, well, I wouldn't say prostitute, but more like, uh, like sex worker, sex performer, because there's a big performance, um, to do with, you know, because he, he's, he's human, he transfers into a werewolf, and, you know, there's a big chase, because that's a whole part of the, I guess, experience, um, and yeah, and yeah, so, um, this, this fox hires, uh, this werewolf and re really cool and hot, like, chase scene through this apartment. Um, no apartment, sorry, fucking hotel. And I re what I really, really like about it is just, uh, the, the stark characters that, ca bleh, 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 fuck. The strength of, um, the main character, which is, um, is it, does the werewolf have a name? Um, oh, I think, uh, I could be wrong, but there's, there's an off-handed line, uh, at the start where, uh, J Jacob's the name of the werewolf, but he was saying, now oh, it's not really his name, um, but I, I quite like, um, yeah, the opening few, few lines, because, fuck, <clears throat> I quite like the opening where there's a few lines, where you, well not a few lines, a few paragraphs where you get really strong basis of Jacob's character and why he's doing this and what he gets out of it um, and what the prospective clients get out of it and his kind of view on society in general. Like, um, it's really, really cool. And uh, yeah, the fox is the typical kind of, I guess, antagonist to this. Um, he's very kind of stuffy uptight guy who's, you know, paying, like, fucking six figures for this, this raucous night, um, because, you know, he, he does, he, he I guess he, well, Jacob, shoot, uh, fuck, Jacob assumes that, he, you know, is, he doesn't know how to experience, like, the only way for him to experience it is through this, this facade, this, this fake experience, um, where he hires a werewolf to, fuck him and chase him and then fuck him again <laughs> and yeah um and yeah so it then goes on it starts getting really like fucking heart thumping heart pumping and it's you know and then there's the there's the, there's the pretty much a release just towards the end and then uh 
this fucking bam, like, twist kick starts it again, and, you know, your heart's hammering, and then all the way to the fucking final paragraph on the final page, and there's the fucking amazing illustrations, um, by Nega, uh, which I probably won't show, because they're quite lewd, um, really punctuate the text, um, and they don't draw away from it, which is really cool. Um, and yeah, no, I fucking love it. Um, I don't know, I'm being a bit coyer than the others because I really think you should read this one. Um, and the last story, like, you know, pick up Heat 7 for those. Um, and yeah, so like, uh, it's, it's a very refreshing, strong sense of a world. And I guess one thing I've been thinking to myself is, not that it is explained or needs to be explained. Uh, there's a bit towards the end where the werewolf is out on the street naked and a police officer comes up and he's very kind of blasé about it, but, you know, he still has a job to do where he kind of tells him, like, oh, you know, you should cover yourself, mate. And it's like, so this happens often? <laughs> it's like, it's a weird, rare glimpse of, like, a strong world building there. and I fucking loved it. Um, um, you know, just this one paragraph and this one, like, interaction between a non-important character just gives, like, a really strong look into that world, uh, where I think it might be, you know, like, uh, I guess you could probably see maybe a more fairy tale or mythical world where there's a glamour and stuff like that, um, because I think, I could be wrong, I could just be reading into my, my own ideas into the text, but I think there were human. I think they were humans. Uh, I say after I remember that Jacob was a human <laughs> before he turned into a werewolf at the start of the fucking story. <laughs> so of course there's a fucking humans in the story. <laughs> oh fuck. Shit. Oh, anyway, going on. It's fucking, oh, it's so cool. I love that story. Oh, it's fucking, I love the last two illustrations uh, by Neger. Um, next up, I I could be wrong, but I think this might be Rukus' first comic, or very closely after, uh, is it Unconditional? No, Cruelty, Cruelty, Cruelty was the first one. Um, I, I quite like this character, uh, comic, like, usually I have, a, I have a kind of a, I guess just personal bug there with, uh, Rukus' expressions. Uh, with her canine characters, uh, <laughs> but this one, like, oh, I don't know what it is, but they're f so cool in this, they're so dynamic, and I quite like the comic. It's a very kind of simple one, um, there's this wolf wakes up in the forest, and it's got a boner, and this small pygmy dragon comes out of nowhere and helps him with it, but, you know, he knows, the wolf knows dragons are tricksters, so, you know, there's a, there's a double edge to this kind of deal. And, um, and yeah, there's, there's a, it's a, it's a fun little twist at the end where, uh, uh, yeah, the, the pygmy dragon's not really so small. <laughs> and yeah, it's cool. I, I quite, like, it's a charming comic, and it's, it's definitely what I like to see in Heat, uh, in terms of comics. Like, very kind of solid, and I guess, t small, tight, small windows, you know, don't need to be large and overarching. You know, give you something nice and solid, and hot and erotic. And I quite like the design of the dragon too. Like he, I'm not yeah. It's like he's got the two eyes, and he's got these other two. I don't know if they're jewels or other eyes or magic things, because these are magic dragons. Um. Yeah. Uh oh. Next up, we've got a poem by White Yeti uh, Dickinson. Oh, it's not Dickens. Dick Dickinsonian. Uh, <laughs> I, I really want to read it all out, um, but I won't. But uh, I'll read the last three lines. Uh, where it's, uh, I'm sorry I was way too loud. The neighbours called the cops, but I left as soon as you explained that I was just a fox. <laughs> oh, it's just so cute and charming. I fucking love White Yodi's poems. Guy's amazing. Um, yeah, so last one we got is um, Code Drop by Tempe Okun with lovely illustrations by Jailbird, which they come out really badly on the webcam, from at least from the, what I'm seeing here. Um, 
with this one, it's really cool. I, okay, what I love about this one is um, the jackal character Tess. Tess her. It's, it, she's so strong, and I fucking love it. Like I, I just, I really love it. Um, so she's in this. Uh, she's stuck in this town after her car breaks down. She needs to finish this code for a job. It's very important because the cutoff's like tonight, and she can't get internet. So she's fucking carrying on and like lashing out at everyone. And then um, this this kind of adorable golden retriever, um, because she hears him. I think I'm pretty sure he gets Rick rolled. I think that's what's implied it's happening. Like she hears like um, you know Rick Astley's never give, gonna give you up like playing, and she spins around and she's like, "You've got internet." <laughs> he's like, "He's like, yeah, crazy lady." <laughs> and uh, and yeah, so. Starts off with like him. Oh no! Sorry. It starts off with like her, pretty kind of seamlessly using him, and then she realizes that like shit. It's like two or three in the morning, and everyone's closed in this small town, and she doesn't have anywhere to crash. And the the golden retriever, you know, offers his place, and she's like instantly sketchy. She's like, "Is this guy gonna like? Is he gonna get me? Like, I know a keto. I can take him down." <laughs> Like, I love how fiery she is, and kind of how logically, well, I mean, logically to me, she thinks about Vince. Uh, and yeah, so, she's, you know, she's kind of wary that she's hitting off so well, she thinks there's something going on here. Like, there's got, there's got to be something bad about him, like, he's just, he's just too, he's too much of a nice guy. And, uh, and like, and a kind of an adorable nerd. Despite being an adorable golden retriever, <laughs> um, and yeah, um, it's a pretty, it's really, it's a really nice kind of close character piece. Um, I guess to kind of sum it up, the only things that really bugged me about it is like towards the end, it was considering everything started off so strong and not so perfect. And it showed how kind of dynamic people can be, um, both from the point of view of Tess Her and then her kind of assumptions of uh, uh, Eric uh, with a K, uh, and and how she fights against these assumptions. And it ends really too perfectly. You know, they kind of they fall in love for a better term of the word, and she's a bit kind of shocked by this um and, and yeah i i think uh, i know for me and my personal tastes i rather seen things a little bit ambiguous like it ended very Look. it ended very cleanly um and, and i'm pretty sure you know these days if i check out tempo's tempo tempo Yokun's work I'll, I'll see that uh He's got a bit more dynamic in that regard. Uh, and the other thing that... Uh, definitely... I think... these I think it could have done with a bit more work. Or... Kind of looked at how to integrate into the story earlier. It's the whole... A few parts where... Tess brought up her parents. It's like... They came up towards the end. And they stood out too much. Like, it's like, why are you printing this up like are you it's like are you printing up your emotional baggage on the first day <laughs> like maybe you're not so perfect lady <laughs> and I was like and I, I felt I think that was the only thing that brought down such an amazing character and it's just printing her personal baggage to shit uh, yeah I, I loved her dialogue and Eric's dialogue and the interplay they had and oh it's so cool um, I'm not too sure what else to say about it, like, um, I'm pretty sure it's also my first, um, Tempe Okun story I've read, um, which is horrible to say, like, <laughs> he's one of those office words, like, I see all the time, it's like, oh yeah, I'm gonna read something by him, oh yeah, I've got, like, three fucking novellas done by him, and I have not read one, was it Six is Wild, and, um, Wind Windfalls, the other one. It was awesome, and you know, I listened to him in interviews, and he's super cool, and still, I mean, I finally read something by him. Um, so, yeah, I guess, summing up, 
Oh, there's one more ad, which is um, Zero Gravity Vixens. Oh, the art's familiar, but I can't quite remember it, the artist. Oh, I just realised I didn't read the Afterglow this time around. Um, so I'm going to assume it says a lot of the same. Uh, I'll probably read it while I'm waiting for this to e edit or something, and then I might add something in. Uh, just by just messing up my hair right now. <laughs> um, so, in summary, Heat 7, it's a bit of a miss for me. Like, I don't know if it was largely just my mood and just of me being overly critical for stuff that's not my personal likes and dislikes. Um, but it, it really falls short. It's like, even coming off all the others um, and saying the the steady improvement over the years just those those first two well not the first two just that one story really killed it for me um and, and yeah <laughs> i just i just really didn't like it i feel horrible but i think i want to be blunt and honest about it um but i, I would still pick up heat seven if not for just candle story but the other everyone else um because everyone puts a lot of hard work and it's still it's still great like there's so many cool things about it so heat seven was brought to us by uh managing editor alobex assistant editor Wu Wei, uh chief publisher jeff eddy actually now that's there assistant editor Wu Wei, i'm gonna look that person up and see who they are and if they're still around and I swear to God, if they're someone fucking famous. <laughs> <coughs> Front cover illustration by Tal Talensi. Oh, uh, oh Deviant Art. Oh. Um, by a Nose by Tony Gray Fox, illustrated by Yuki. Um, oh, actually, I bet I better mention this. Um, Tony Gray Fox's fur affinity is T Gray Fox. Um, which I guess doesn't translate well with his name, so I think that makes it there. Um, A Werewolf's Last Warning by Wu Wei, uh, illustrated by Solid Asp. The Day I Met You by Corgi. One Night by For, for Fuck. One Night by Feora Meridian, illustrated by Dark Natasha. Cowboy Briefs by Green Monkey. Oh, that's who it is. I'm pretty sure he's a hard plus or some distributor, uh, contributor. Pretty sure, ninety nine percent sure. Um, the one that got away by Adam Wan, the taste of the wild by Candrel, illustrated by oh shit, can I remember how to pronounce his name from the uh, <laughs> um, oh no, my Blake, my Blake, uh, is coming, um, Franco, Franco, the table's the last death. Um, by Christobel Joffrey Hoffman, no, it's Christobel, no. No, I fucked it up. I can't... I, I failed to pronounce his name. Uh, by Nega. Uh, Odd Coupling by Rukas. Dickinsonian <laughs> by White UAT. Illustrated by Dragon Drawer. Oh, I'm pretty sure I was checking out his art recently. He's no super familiar. Anyway. Uh, Code Drop by Tempe Okun. Illustrated by Jailbird. Uh, Zero G Vixens by Foxer. Uh, Foxer 421 at Fear Affinity. Uh, Afterglow illustration by Kiovi. Oh, that's cute. Oh, it's, it's there on the page. <laughs> uh, back cover illustration by Yuki. Uh, oh, yeah, shit, that would make sense because it's the same, the same picture. <laughs> um, um, so, he is by Sofa Wolves 2010. Uh, Heat is published yearly and welcomes submissions, stories, arts, comics, and ideas for future issues. For full guidelines, please see our website at softwolf.com. Contact us by email at heat at softwolf.com. And they are furry publications, so please, if you've got a story, make it furry. <laughs> um, and yeah, that was Heat 7. Um, I suppose it's a bit of a downer. It took me so long to get through. Um... But I just wanted me time. Uh, next up is Heat 8. Which... Oh, shit. Which one's Heat 8? Which 
When is Heat Day? I, I do kind of want to do the Heat that came out, Heat 14. But, because like, uh, by the time I fucking get to it, it might be next year at this rate. <laughs> uh, oh yeah, shit, Heat 8, my favourite cover by um, Kamui, uh, I think it's pronounced and not Kaomi. Um I love this one, I loved it. Um, yeah, back when uh, he was doing it, uh, he was, you know, obviously uh, putting out promo stuff of like, just, I, can't, I guess, what would you say, how would you put it, just, uh, segments of it, of saying off all the characters, and I loved all, um, kind of descriptions of everyone, and, oh, it's so good, like, um, I'm, I might, oh, in the next video, I'll chuck the link to it, uh, but, oh, it's so cool, and that ring tail at the back there, <laughs> uh, there, with the panty shot, oh, yeah, the, the, we can, um, that not cheetah, but probably a serval or some some form of jungle cat has taken a picture of it. Um, yeah. Okay, he ate. Actually, wait, what's in it? Mm. Oh, Jules 49. Shit, foosball. I mean, ooh, oh yeah, stagnated by Kei Murasaki. I love that story. Hey, and the wallet story by Kyle Gold. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I might read this one quicker then. Oh yeah, that story. Oh, I just I just flicked open and looked at the pictures of the first story. I'm like, oh yeah. I think I've actually. No, no, I lie. Aside from, no, no, I have, I have, re I have read everything in this one. Yeah, yeah, because Jill's forty ninth. I love that one. It's the one with um, yeah, Jill and the Gray Fox, and oh, I love that Gray Fox character. Yeah, that's Heat 8. <laughs> anyway, I've been Rafer, and I'll catch you later. <laughs>